when someone goes missing, at what point should you assume there's been foul play? It's a regular dilemma for the police because, after all, most missing people turn up safe and well. In this case, though, detectives have assumed the worst, and that means murder. Melanie Hall went missing back in June from the centre of Bath near her home in Wiltshire, and no one's seen her since. But one week after her disappearance, a conversation was overheard just outside Melanie's home village. We were walking along the uh, Kennet and Avon Canal towards Bradford and Avon. Uh, we noticed a black and white cat just ran across our path onto a canal boat. Uh, it wasn't until a couple of days later that the, the name Melanie actually twigged that it could be connected to the Melanie Hall case. That narrowboat may well be immaterial, but it hasn't yet been traced. It was dark blue with a beige interior and the couple were aged late 20s to early 30s. Melanie was 25, a graduate in psychology intending to do a PhD. Melanie was a lovely girl, a wonderful daughter, full of life looking forward to the future. She had finished her degree a year ago and had probably taken the year out to just enjoy life. Melanie's mum works at the Royal United Hospital in Bath and found Melanie a temporary job as a clerical assistant. She'd almost completed a year working at the hospital and where she'd started a new relationship with one of the doctors and she was hoping to move into her own little house within six weeks. Oh, hi, oh hi. Melanie, hello. Is everything okay for this weekend? Um, yeah, um, I've got to go home first and pick up my stuff, but I'll meet right. you at once later if that's okay, yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. So great. Oh, oh uh, that's my people going. I'll catch you later. Okay, maybe see you for lunch, yeah? yeah. Okay, bye. bye Melanie appeared to me an affectionate and attractive woman. I sort of dated her three weeks and we did quite a lot of things together. We went out for meals, to the cinema, to clubs and had a very good time actually. Saturday the 8th of June and they started the evening at a barbecue with friends. Hello, how are you doing? Got your dress? Yeah, I got it today, help me choose it. Good, Don't yeah? it. What have we got there? Lots of stuff for the barbecue. And everybody's out there so you might as well just go and pop it. In the fridge, yeah. Then? No problem. Later that night, four of them decided to go night clubbing. This is Walcott Street in you Bath. Have to be the worst driver on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> How's that chicken oh, steak? No, it's really good. Hello. 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 I went to the loon and I came back to the dance floor and I sort of had a look across the dancing floor and I saw Melanie dancing with another man. Initially I couldn't believe it because I was so surprised. I became rather disappointed and a bit upset as well. I couldn't explain it. We had a wonderful time and we're in really good spirits and we're out to have some fun and she was dancing with this other man and in a rather intimate fashion so I went to the car to wait for her. I just needed some time to sort myself out and think about what happened. Smoked a cigarette and I was waiting for some sort of reaction. Either that Melanie would come out of the club and sort of look for me. She knew where the car was, so... And I was just waiting and nothing really happened and I decided i go home. The friends left at ten past one, assuming Philip was still there to take Melanie home. Hey, I was still on the stairs talking to the bank, sir. And I saw a pretty girl sitting there. I was talking to a bloke, like five foot ten. Um, with a dark complexion, very tidy dress, black trousers, silk brown shirt, black shoes, and a very flashy watch. I 
a little while later I've seen a couple lead the club together. Okay, there you go. Right, here we go. There Thanks you go. a lot. Thanks a lot. Yes, please. We were heading along Walcott Street towards Cadillac's nightclub. On the way up, we spotted a couple arguing outside the church hall. He was giving her a hard time, wasn't he? Yeah, lover's turf. The lady had very blonde hair. He was about five foot ten, had dark hair, and was wearing a black bomber style jacket. At the same time, further up Walcott Street towards Bath City Centre, a blonde in a light-coloured dress was seen being coaxed into the podium car park. If this wasn't Melanie, who was it? On Monday, Melanie failed to turn up at work. I was concerned, but I did wonder if she'd taken the day off, and I put a note on there asking her to contact me as soon as possible. But by the evening, there'd been no sign of her. And the note stayed there for several days. I did feel right from the very first day that something has happened to her. And as the days have gone by, and the weeks, and the months, I'm quite sure something serious has happened to her. She had everything to look forward to. She was young, attractive had so much to look forward to in her life, and I'm sure she wouldn't have done this of her own free will. If she is still alive, I'd, I would like just to know where she is so that we could just put our minds at rest. But if she's dead, we really badly need to know. So at least we could just bring her home. Now, the last couple of days, you might have seen publicity about this case um, here in the Bristol Evening Post and in today's papers here in the National. The case of, of Melanie Hall, who's missing, has been linked with the murder of Louise Smith last Christmas, almost uh, a year ago, and with about half a dozen rapes and uh, attempted rapes that have taken place over about six years. Now, Steve Livings, do you think it's the same offender? I don't know. I deal in physical evidence and fact. And at this time... There's no physical evidence or fact to link Melanie Hall's disappearance with the murder of Louise Smith or the series of rapes that have happened in Bath. All right, well, look, let's just stick with the disappearance of, of Melanie for the moment. The most obvious man to find is the chap who was seen at the night, at Cadillac's nightclub talking to somebody who looked very much like Melanie. Yes, this man was sat in an armchair with a girl described similarly to Melanie. He's about five foot seven. He's dark hair, quite noticeable because he's tanned, very tanned, and he's wearing a flashy gold watch on his wrist. Now, he might not have been with Melanie, and even if he was with Melanie, there's no evidence she was abducted at this point. No. In fact, I, I've got a belief that Melanie may have been befriended by somebody. In that last 40 minutes, the club was open. Her friends have gone. She may have realised that. And I believe she may have gone off with somebody voluntarily. Maybe she got in somebody's car outside with this, whoever she went with. It's that person I appeal to. Did you take Melanie? Did you go away with her that night? Please help us. Telephone us now. OK, this is the night of Saturday, the 8th of June. What about the, the sightings outside the club? There were two. First, of course, the, the couple who were seen, and I think somebody said, oh, he seemed to be giving her a hard time. And then a little later on, the girl seeing slightly manhandled into a, into a car park. That's right. The similarity is this. All those girls are similarly described as Melanie. A young blonde lady. Now it may be that that's not Melanie at all and again please come forward so that I can eliminate you from our inquiries. And again the sighting on the Kennet and Avon Canal likely to be a red herring that is it? Could well be a red herring it's just the name Melanie it's just a chance. Perhaps the witness got it wrong I don't know. Okay well if you can help resolve any of those sightings here's the number it's a free call don't hesitate and of course don't hesitate if you've heard anything about this case and can help in that way 0500 600 600. Mr Livings has several colleagues here tonight. Others are at the instant room in Bath, which is on 01225 842460. That's Bath 842460.
Now to Preston in Lancashire and the murder of a university student, Janet Murgatroyd. It's almost three months, Saturday the 15th of June. That was a memorable day though, the big bomb in Manchester went off that morning and England played Scotland in the European Championship that afternoon. But for Janet, it was a day for celebration. She just finished her exams and it was one of the warmest weekends of the year. There was a body, that of a young woman. It had been in the water only about half an hour. Janet was 20, a local girl who went to the local university. She was studying law and had just completed her first year. She'd planned to go into Manchester that day to shop for clothes, but changed her mind. Then, hearing of the Arndale Centre bomb, she was thankful that she'd cancelled. That afternoon, Janet met up with a friend from university. Oh, I didn't tell you. I bought a Greek phrase book. I'll lend it you if you like. Yeah. During the holidays, the two planned to go oh, backpacking yeah. through it's Europe. It's difficult, because it says you've got to learn the alphabet first. Oh, stuff that. Yeah, that's what I thought. So... I'd never travelled around Europe before, and Janet hadn't, so it was going to be a new experience for both of us that we were going to share together. We couldn't have been happier. We were both on top of the world that day. We really were. We thought nothing was going to stop us from here on in. That was it. We were free to do whatever we wanted for those ten weeks. And we were going to make sure we were going to do them as well. So what, spend a month there? What, in Greece? No, no, I think we should live a bit earlier, spend more time in Italy. I think I'm going to like the Italians. But aren't they supposed to pinch your bum all the time? Maybe we'd better get an Italian phrase, because they all... <laughs> <laughs> we were very happy. We'd, we'd been in the pub quite a lot of the afternoon. And it was going to be our last night out before we went on our holidays. We were making it a good night. It's really crowded out here. What about there? Excuse me, are these seats taken? Oh, you're right. It was towards the end of the night and we had had a lot to drink by that stage. So we decided to stay in the Adelphi for last orders. Somehow we got, we got separated and we ended up make, parting company and going our own way home. And that was the last time I ever saw Janet. And, and I remember thinking to myself that I should wait for her and make sure that she got in a taxi safely or to make sure that she came back to my flat with me. But it, it just didn't happen. And, <clears throat> and the worst of it is I can't even remember the last thing that I said to her or the last thing that she said to me. Janet really had had quite a lot to drink and maybe found it hard to get a taxi. At any rate, shortly before 1am, she was heading towards Penwortham Bridge. Security cameras tracked her as she weaved her way down Fishergate. I remember that night because I was late picking my mother up from her sister's. Look at that girl walking by herself at this hour. Shall we give her a lift? Yeah, uh, she'll be all right. 
Mother wanted me to stop, give the girl a lift. So I just said to my mother, there's no way I'm going to give her a lift. She could be sick in the car. And we just carried on our way home. Did you see Janet waiting at the start of Penwortham Bridge? And did you see anyone else in the vicinity? shouting at somebody, could have been anybody on the path, anything. You get it a lot down here, people coming from town, clubs and everything, so I never thought nothing more about it, just went to back to bed. A cab driver saw two significant events around this time. I remember as I approached the bridge, I saw a couple in front of the Volvo garage, they were arguing. She was told than it was. And as I turned onto the bridge, I saw a man running across the front of me, and then I saw a girl in front of him, it looked like he was chasing her. Perhaps I should have stopped. About 15 minutes later, half past one or so, these two brothers were coming across Penwortham Bridge. We've been out since Preston at Tokyo Joe's nightclub. And of course, it was a nice warm night. We decided to walk home. When we reached the far side of the bridge, I heard a noise, that of a girl. It was a, a moaning, groaning sound. Uh. I've, well, I've worked in a dental surgery and it reminded me of the noise somebody makes when they've come out of anaesthetic, like they're incapable of talking. It is um, a funny area and we have seen stranger things before and nothing has come of that. So we just carried on where we didn't think twice about it. Janet probably lay unconscious on the riverbank until the tide rose on Sunday morning, picked her up and carried her upstream. She had massive head injuries, but died finally of drowning. Her clothes were found beside Penwortham Bridge. I can only hope that Janet didn't suffer. I, I can only feel hatred towards the person that's killed her. Absolute total hatred. And also disgust at whomever is shielding him. And... Uh, and I hope that they don't sleep at nights, really. Because I find it difficult to sleep at nights. Um, I, I wake up sometimes at two and three in the morning thinking, well, I'll just check that Janet's home. And then, and then I burst into tears because I know she's never going to come home. Um, and that's foul. And someone knows. Someone is shielding Janet's killer. I'm absolutely certain of that. Um, so I just hope that this helps, really. Three months after the murder, this morning, at the parish church near her home in Penwortham, Janet was finally buried. Graham Gooch, you think her attacker was likely a local man? How would local people recognise him? How would they know him? Well, th this is a man who has committed a very serious offence. It will play on his mind. He will have, his behaviour may have probably changed just after the event, and he will still be thinking about it. He will still want to tell somebody about it, and may have told somebody about it. Given the extraordinary level of violence, it seems most unlikely he wouldn't have done something approaching this before. I mean, is this going to be a man with a criminal record, with a violent past? Well, certainly, I'm convinced that he has attacked women before. He may not have had... Um, a criminal record because the women may not have reported but this is a man who's used violence on women before and I believe if he's not caught he will do it again. You think that? Yes. Piecing together the physical descriptions you've got of him, how do you describe him? Well the man we're looking for is about five foot ten to six foot tall. He's a white or pale skinned Asian man. We know he's got black hair. He was wearing a long sleeved white shirt and very dark probably black trousers. Now, there are several people you need to eliminate. First of all, the two people arguing at the Volvo garage, but others who were seen on security cameras in the area. 
32 men who were walking down Fishergate Hill just before Janet, describe the importance of them. Really. Well, we're particularly anxious to speak to the man we can see on the right in the white shirt with the dark trousers and the dark hair. Um, we really need to find out who he is you know, to eliminate him from the inquiry because he was going just ahead of Janet. It says the 16th of June. Actually, it's late on the night of uh, Saturday the 15th, early in the morning of Sunday the 16th of June, about 1 a.m. Then there was a man walking up Strand Road. To, roughly, th those two roads meet, of course, just before Pinworth and Bridge. Yes, this man was walking towards the scene of the murder at about the right time, so he will have arrived on the, at the bridge about the same time as Janet. We can see him walking towards the bridge and later a better picture of him coming back. Now, he was there at the right time. We really do need to speak to him. There's not much going on around that area at the time, so who was he? If you can help in any way, do please call 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600, even if you've just suspicions. You can try the instant room at Preston, that's on 01772 410828. That's Preston in Lancashire, 410828. This coming Saturday, it would have been Deborah Wood's 21st birthday. Why she's not alive to celebrate is a mystery that we hope tonight someone will solve. Debbie, who lived in Holbeck in Leeds, disappeared late one afternoon in early January and nothing more was heard of her for well over a week. What's real, Andrew? Officers were first alerted at 4.30 this morning when a resident reported a fire. Police found the burning body of a young girl, aged, they believe, between 15 and 25. Debbie was brought up in Morley, to the south of Leeds, but her parents separated when she was a child. She started drinking in her teens and found it hard to keep a job. But she stayed in Leeds and kept in contact with both parents. Once a week, she met her mum to visit charity shops in Morley. Anyway, I'm nearly 21, you know. Mm. I'm staying at my mate's house for Christmas dinner. Oh, that's good. I tell you what, though, I could really do with some new winter clothes. It's absolutely freezing in that flat. Oh, well, we'll have to see what we can do, <laughs> won't we? Hey, I like that. Yeah? You think it's my colour? Yeah, do you like it? All right. Come on, then. Let's try it on. Oh, they're nice. Ah, we we'll try them on. They're a bit expensive. Oh, don't worry. It's Christmas. I'll treat you. Oh, thanks, Mum. Yeah. What do you think? Ah, it suits you. It really suits you. Yeah. Are you happy with that for your Christmas? Yeah. That'll be six forty-nine, love, please. Oh, thanks, Mum. Thanks very much. When she left school, she got a job, and then she she managed to get a place of her own. She just chuffed about it. She would come and go when she wanted. I think she knew quite a lot of people, you know. But she's like me, she'll, um, if she, if she stood at a bus stop and she'll just talk to anyone, you know, to get friendly with them. Now, police need to trace all Debbie's friends, including two who went to her bedsit in Holbeck shortly before Christmas. I went downstairs to see who was at the door and I saw two men. One I think is called Gary. Debbie in? No. He was about five feet eight and a half inches tall, had hair that was cropped in the sides and longer and oiled in the top. He was wearing a dark jacket. I would say he was about early to mid twenties in age. So who are these two? Hey, Debbie, I'll just put this in there. Ta, put them in. Yeah. I need a uh, blue roll. Yeah. Debbie's father met her on the day she disappeared. They went shopping in her local supermarket. He lived nearby. Soft stuff. Just put it in. Well, it's your money. Yes. Can you do me a favour? Can you drop this stuff off at my flat? Yeah. And I'll see you after. Sure. Is that all right? No problem, look. Leave it with me. Late that morning, Debbie met her father once again in Big Lil's bar in central Leeds. 
I wondered how everybody was. Hey, Char, cheers already for that then. Hey, by the way, how's your mum? She's all right. I saw her the other day. I like your new gear. Yeah, I got it for Christmas. Can I have a light? Your mum get you that? Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Hey, you look smart. Hello, mum. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Listen, I haven't got much money. Can you make me an appointment at the housing office for Thursday? Yeah. OK, I'll see you outside the town hall. About ten? OK. See you then. At five o'clock, Debbie left the pub and headed off. But where did she go? She certainly never went home. I went about two hours, I kept, I kept walking around, and then I, I came home then. And uh, I thought, well, if she rung me up, I'll tell her off, like, for not meeting me. But I couldn't understand, because when we make arrangements to meet anyway, she always turns up. I was driving down Cardigan Road, going into town to meet some friends. I saw this figure of a man over this person on the floor as if he's trying to pick him up I, I just thought that it was two mates fighting you see so I didn't want to get involved so I just keep on going three and a half hours later and less than 150 yards away as I walked down Chapel Lane I could smell what smelled like a bonfire and I could hear crackling noises and as I turned the bend, I could see the fire and I realised that I should phone the fire brigade. The next day I saw it on the television, it, they found a, a decomposed body, badly burnt, down Burley Railway Station. I know I bought them clothes and it just fits, what little bits, what, what they found on a body. But I just rung up one morning. I told him that that's my daughter. Well, Detective yeah, Superintendent yeah, Andy Brown, Debbie's body was set alight. What does that tell us about her killer? It's probably the act of a desperate man, um, an attempt to try and conceal her identity or at least try, try and get rid of the, uh, the evidence that might have connected him to the, to the murder. It did delay us uh, identifying Debbie's body and um, we have had difficulties since with some of the problems. Now, she was last seen on the evening of the 4th of January. Her body was found on the 14th. When do you believe she may have been killed? We think she actually um, was killed shortly after she left Big Lil's pub in the city centre of Leeds. Um, and then there we have this 10-day gap where someone's either kept her in storage or has known where she's been. And then something has prompted that person to actually take her to the railway station and set a light to her body. It is difficult, isn't it, in 10 days to hide a body from anyone else, really? Yes, it is, but it, it depends where it's been kept. And we don't know what the reason uh, was for actually uh, setting it on fire on the 14th. So it's vital, really vitally important, that you trace Debbie's movements on the 4th of January after she left Big Lil's pub? The, the, the important thing is we, we don't know why she was in the Burley area. Um, it may well be that it's the murderers from the Bur Burley area and that's, uh, that's why she's ended up in that, in that area. We have not found any friends or any pubs that she's visited. Uh, it's a mystery why she's, she's actually ended up uh, in Burley. Now the person that we saw in that reconstruction, a so-called friend called Gary, you've traced a lot of her friends but you haven't managed to trace him. We've traced a large amount of friends but uh, Gary's someone that was obviously on the scene um, around Christmas time, so we are interested in him. He hasn't come forward. We know that he went to a home uh, in Beverly Terrace. He went with another man on one occasion. We haven't traced Gary. I want him to come forward or someone to tell us who he is. Another significant sighting, again, the, the one we saw in the film, was the person bending over what appeared to be a body or certainly a figure in the Burley area shortly before the fire was found. It was only a few hours before and, uh, I mean, the worst scenario was that it was actually someone dragging Debbie's body to the railway station, which again would uh, 
lead us to think that the killer is from the Burley area. There may be an innocent explanation, and if there is, then we need someone to come forward and give us that explanation. Andy Brown, thank you very much indeed. Well, as always, do call us here if you can help. It's vitally important that we catch this person. Remember, it is a free call number. Or if the numbers here are busy, as they are at the moment, try the incident room in Leeds. That's a free phone, and that's 0800 318 001. That's 0800 318 001.